Less than a month after the release of private investigator Melinda Kidder's findings about the true nature of his business, police reports indicated Barry had moved across town to a new location. A White House that sat next to his former Camelot brothel with an address of 1125 Vandiver. It was disgusting. How was it disgusting? It was gross. The house was never clean. It was just a dope house. You could go there and live and do what, what you wanted to do. Dope. As long as you gave the money, you know? I mean, the bed bugs were so bad in there. They didn't ever have any food. I didn't eat for days. Police were under no impression that Barry's move meant he would retire. Within months of Barry setting up shop at the new location, police had received multiple complaints about the prostitution operation at the house with the large Green Bay Packers emblem prominently displayed in its front window. In October, a woman who identified herself as Sandra Bullock called police to report prostitution at the house. She told police that two white men named Barry and Ryan ran the operation. She had witnessed crack and powder cocaine at the residence and had even purchased crack directly from Barry and Ron. As with the Columbia College complaint from a year earlier, the woman was able to give officers specific details about the operation, including prices for sexual services. And just like the earlier complaint, the final report was prepared and handed over to Narcotics Unit Detective Jeffrey Ruxted. And just like the earlier complaint, no action was taken. Two months later, officers Clinton Sinclair and Ryan Brunstrom were called by the same woman, wanting to report a physical altercation that occurred at 1125 Vandiver. The woman told police that the incident started when she tried to rescue her friend who she believed was working as a prostitute at the quote, Ho House. After the officers refused to make an arrest, the woman spit on them. Barry Manthe's move to 1125 Vandiver not only signified a change in location, but coincided with large shifts in the way his operation was run, an evolution that mirrored the sex industry as a whole's transition to the digital age. In the old days, placing ads in the classified section of a newspaper brought the local brothels all the business they needed. Do you know how the brothels were advertised? Um, ads in the newspaper. Okay. Back then, you'd just go down to the Tribune and place an ad. Okay. It was a regular part of the Columbia Tribune's advertising to have personal ads. I would say the vast majority of them were ads for prostitution. But as technology advanced, so did the way prostitution operations advertise. One of the girls said that you can post on this site called Backpage. There are certain internet sites that seem to have a heavy focus on sex trafficking and premier among them was Backpage. Backpage was a classified advertising website launched in 2004. By 2011, it had grown to be the second largest site of its kind. During the investigation, we learned that Barry Manthe was the master of all the Backpage advertisement done by the girls at his brothel on Vandiver. It was using his computer and using his credit card and that he was the one promoting all the girls that worked at his at the brothel on, on Vandiver. Uh, Barry would put them up initially. Some of the girls didn't like it. They would go and re-edit it. But it's always to Barry Matthews' email address. And his credit card? Yep. Four wrongs. Who would, be the, who would put the ads on that page? Barry. They would put the ads on yep. that page? I know that because um, the girl that um, got I got the heroin from that was on probation, that lived in the front, Barry took pictures of her to put the ads on that page. Barry paid for them, and um, he, he would use his tablet um, to put them on. Or Barry would update an old ad, you know. But he liked me to put them in, and he paid for them. Okay. Off his, off his bank account or credit card mm -hmm. or whatever. Regardless of where the ads were posted, the traffic was directed to one place, the landline phone that sat in the living room of the brothel. They would call. There was a landline there that they would call and they would ask for Farah or whatever name that you had. The number at Vandiver was registered to Ron and the women were given strict instructions on how to talk to potential clients when they called. Well, he'd get pissed off if you didn't say the right things or, you know, or the prices or if girls didn't seem like they were like trying to reel the tricks in or anything, you know, and 
So he'd, he'd take the phone away from other girls or wouldn't let him answer the phone. If a girl wasn't answering the phone in a way that Barry approved of, he'd take the phone away from her. Mm-hmm. And some people couldn't answer the phone? Okay. Because they'd have to get approval who can answer the phone from Barry, right? Yeah, or he'd get mad if he caught him answering the phone. Like, some girls like to hog the phone, too, and, like, not, um, like, tell who all is working. And, you know, they would only, like, advertise their self or just whatever kind of angle they were going going for. Did clients set up appointments or did they just show up? They used to show up and they would call. And we'd go out to them or we'd give them directions or, you know, they were regulars and they just come over and knock on the door. If none of the girls were awake or available to answer the phone, Barry would improvise. If a girl would sleep, Barry would answer it in like a female's voice. And he'd be like, hello. And then he'd hurry up and put the phone to a girl's ear. And then like try to wake her up so she can, you know, finish talking. He, do he does that all the time, but usually it's a girl. But if people sleep or ain't nobody answering the phone, he'll pick it up and try to sound like a woman and run through the house to give it to whoever he wants to give it to. When clients arrived at the brothel, the girls were directed to assemble into a lineup where they attempted to entice the customer into choosing them. As with answering the phone, Barry gave strict instructions on how the women were to talk and behave in the lineup. To ensure compliance, but not scare the customer, Barry or Ron would monitor the interactions from an unseen location. Lineup is some a guy come in and a girl will knock on all the room doors, tell everybody, you know, it's a customer here. So all the girls are standing in the line and the, the customer will pick a girl. We would all like meet in the kitchen living room area and stand and they would pick one. It's usually about four to five of us um, at a time. Yeah, we'd all have to stand uh, and they get, a, you know, we tell them our name and they would pick a girl to go to the room with. Sometimes customers didn't want to or were unable to come to the brothel. To service these clients, Barry would drive the women to an outcall. Outcalls is basically if somebody want an outcall that's at a hotel or a house, you know, um, they give them a the price. The outcall price is 150 for the half an hour, 200 for the hour. Barry get his 40 or $60. Basically drive the female to the residence and he wait outside in the car until they come out. The most popular women at the brothel and the ones treated the best by Barry were the ones who had just arrived. A position that inspired friendly competition in some situations and outright jealousy among fellow sex workers and others. The new girl. Some of them was brought by friends, the of girls that was already there. Some of them word of mouth on the street. They're, they were supposed to be the ones that answer the phone and go on the calls a lot, you know? <laughs> All the, the other girls would change their clothes, put on makeup, do their hair, because they know if you're a new girl, you're always going to get picked for like that first week or so. Did you notice where their uh, new girls would be sent to preferred uh, clients? Mm -hmm. Barry would have regulars that um, are certain guys that he, he would call. He would call some clients when he got a new girl. So these were like VIP clients that were called as soon as a new girl came in, or they would call Barry's cell phone or Ron's cell phone to see if there's any new girls in. Did Barry treat the new girls better? Yep. A any specific ways or just um, general? Just was chatting it up with them, you know, letting them know like how much money they can make, um, asking them stuff about like they where they live at and if they ain't got nowhere to live, they can live there. Um, if they got kids, they can bring their kids, you know, just stuff like that. According to women interviewed, prices for sessions reached as high as $150 to $200 and dipped to $60 or lower during desperate times. I started working that night. Um, I remember 4th of July, the day of 4th of July, I made over $3,000. Um, I had to give them $20 for each customer that I had, 20 to $25 for each customer that I had. Barry was the one that drove the car and Ron was the smaller one that lived in the front room and he's the one that would take the money each time that I made a, had a customer. Although Barry only collected around $20 off of each half hour block, he instituted a much more profitable revenue stream in addition to his house fee, one that not only fed his bottom line, but kept workers trapped in a continual state of indentured servitude.